this, t- this topic. And so I want to make sure that um, you are a part and make sure you catch online and don't miss a Sunday in November. It is going to be good. But this morning, I want to share to you a message that just really the Lord lit a fire in my heart for this. Um, I don't know if it was a month ago or so. And it, it really, it was inspired when I heard this podcast of this author, uh, John Mark Comer. It was inspired um, by that. And then I also read a book by him called uh, A Book on Deception and Lies. And so I, I hope you enjoy this message as we talk about the devil's number one weapon. Now, just after sundown, it was October 30th, 1938, aliens invaded America. The harbingers of an advanced Martian civilization began to enslave the land of the free. The first wave landed in an unexpected uh, notion in Grover's Mill, not far from Princeton University. What happened was Professor Richard Pearson was standing watch at his Princeton uh, observatory when he noticed... An, two explosions on Mars, and he, know, he also thought it was a meteor shower coming in at the same time. So he went to the location to investigate, and upon arrival, instead of finding space rock, he found a large metal cylinder in an open field, still steaming from the entry and broadcasting odd scraping noises from within the shell. As reporters and first responders and onlookers began to examine the crash site, the cylinder began to open up and the terrifying monstrosity of alien violence began to unfold. One on-site reporter, Carl Carl Phillips, broadcasted a chilling report live on CBS. He said, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I've ever witnessed. I can see peering out of that black hole two luminous disks. I've even witnessed, I can see peering out of the black hole. He says, is it, is it eyes? Is it is kind of like a serpent? The mouth V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips seems to quiver and pulsate. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the alien and it leaps out at, at the advancing men. It says, it, it strikes them head on. It says, good Lord, they're turning into flames. The whole field is caught on fire. The woods, the barn, the gas tanks of automobiles, it's spreading everywhere. It's it's coming this way. And at that point, his voice abruptly cut out, and all you could hear was the eerie hiss of the radio. And what happened was pandemonium began to break out in America. It says urbanites began to flood and tear. People took refuge in churches. Pregnant women went into labor early. People, sadly, in that moment committed suicide. Looting began to break out in the streets, and because we're America, people began to grab their guns and prepare for war. And of course, this wasn't really true. It was a simply dramatic, fictional story being presented by Orson Welles on the radio. The 23-year-old actor and director of Mercury Theater on the Air, a new radio program on CBS, radio was a brand, at this moment was a brand new art form. And so it was a golden moment for trying to push the limits and try new things, and Orson Welles was doing that. However, America at that moment was on the verge of war with Germany. The economy was still recovering from the Great Depression. Food was scarce in that moment. Just weeks before, there was the great New England hurricane of 1938, which was the most devastating storm that they ever saw strike New England, leaving over 700 dead and about 63,000 homeless. And to mix it all off, it was the the dark on the night before Halloween, and you have the perfect recipe for uh, pandemonium. What happened was this, as many listeners actually tuned into a different show that had a more popular show, but it ended before Orson Welles' show. So when Orson Wa- when that show ended, they tuned in to Orson Welles' show in the middle of the report that sounded like a live report from the news of CBS. So many were shocked and had no idea that it was a dramatic um, show. And because they thought it was real, they began to respond accordingly. See, deception is simply that. It's deceiving. It's easy for us to believe deceptions because I like to say this, is deception is 
a lie, a tortilla of, of lie with a little bit of truth wrapped in the middle. It, you know, like the earth is flat. There's people that believe the earth is flat. There's people that believe that, that we never landed on the moon. Or, you know, is there really a Bigfoot? That's a great question. Deception is, can be hard to identify unless you know the truth. And also, de- de- deception is hard to identify because of our own desires. I mean, when we want something so bad, we are very good at convincing ourselves that it's good for us, is, aren't we? When we want something so bad, we, we convince ourselves and we get our minds to justify whatever action it may be. I mean, we convince ourselves it's only one donut. It's only one carton of ice cream until 12 donuts and five cartons later, then all of a sudden we're like, okay, maybe we should stop. Or how about this? How about this if you're single? You know, this dating relationship isn't that bad. You know, parents, uh, teenagers can say, my parents, yeah, my parents don't like the person. Or, yeah, I know there's a lot of red flags, but I'm sure it'll work out in the end. Like relationships just magically have a gravitational pull to go smooth. Uh, or how about this? I know I don't have the money right now, but, but I really need this item. Or I really need an iPhone 13. Or I really need this car. Or I really need this vacation. And I don't have the money, but I'll put it on the card and I'll pay it off somehow. Right? We're good at deceiving ourselves. And so, so you, you look at, you wrap all this together and it is so difficult to know the truth. And when it comes to our faith in America, we're facing deception more than ever before. We have pastors and leaders on social media saying one thing, and we have pastors and leaders over here saying the exact opposite. We can find an article online to support whatever um, philosophical or theological uh, point we want to um, agree with. We can find it. So how do we know what to believe? And how do we move forward in truth? And why is there so much confusion in our country and confusion within the body of Christ, the family of Jesus? So we're going to learn this morning that the number one weapon that the devil uses to distract, to disrupt, to detour and destroy God's people is this thing called deception. See, in the church world, there's this thing called spiritual warfare. And all that really means is spiritual warfare is identifying the tactics of the devil, our spiritual enemy, and combating those uh, tactics is called spiritual warfare. And the number one thing that he uses is deception. See, what you don't understand is that the devil appeared in your, in your room with a pitchfork and with flames. Um, you would be scared probably, yeah. But you would go, hey, that's the devil, <laughs> right? You would know it's him, and if he says, hey, do this, you're going to be like, eh, like, I don't think so. Like, I don't, I don't trust you, bro, right? <laughs> but, so he's not going to come to you that way. The, the Bible talks about him being disguised as the angel of light, right? Deception. And so we're going to look at how um, the devil uses deception all throughout the scriptures. We're going to go from Genesis to Revelation in 25 minutes. And so get your seatbelts on, okay? And then we're going to look at how deception can, uh, listen to this. This is so important. Deception often leads to doubt. And doubt by itself isn't bad. But doubt, if it's not handled appropriately, if it's misdirected, doubt often leads to disobedience. And so every week at Wind Up Family Church, we have a slogan. It's like the main theme throughout the message. If you can repeat this morning's slogan with me. If you can say, trusting God's truth protects me from the devil's deception. And that's a longer one online, so but go ahead and type that in and, say, and type it in and say, trusting God's truth protects me from the devil's 
devil's deceptions. So the very beginning of the Bible, we're going to look at how in the very beginning when life was perfect, when Adam and Eve didn't know sin, when Adam and Eve, all they knew was peace, all they knew was joy, all, they didn't know pain, they didn't know suffering, they didn't know hunger, they didn't know any of that, and life was good. They were provided for, they were taken care of, they had no reason to doubt or mistrust their Heavenly Father. They walked with Him in the cool of the evening. They w had nothing but goodness. And yet, we see the devil showed up, not with a pitchfork, not with demons, not trying to intimidate them, not trying to overpower them. Because listen, if you are a believer, the devil has already been defeated. He has no power over you or me. And because he has no power... He can't come and, or, and t to try to overpower us, so he comes through deception. Look at Genesis chapter 3 in the very beginning of the Bible. Verse 1 says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. Now, keep that verse on the screen for a moment. The Hebrew word for shrewdest means cunning or subtle. So our spiritual enemy is shrewd and yet subtle. He operates in subtle deception to get our eyes off of God and his truth. If he showed up um, in the garden with any other way, Eve and, and, and Adam would have probably known this, but instead he comes cutting and with deception. Look at the next, keep going. It says, one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat, that God said. You must not eat of it or touch it or you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be open as soon as you eat it and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. So, what does the, what is the, what is the enemy do? Well, the first thing, he starts off by asking a question that he knows isn't true. He knows it's not true, but he wants to get Eve's eyes off of God's provision onto his prohibition. And if he can get her eyes to shift, then he can begin to work his deception. And she responds with the truth. No, no, we can eat freely of anything. It's just this one tree, this one rule. I mean, think about it. One rule. People say, yeah, yeah my parents have all these rules, or, or the Bible has all these rules. Man, we couldn't even handle one rule. <laughs> so, I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's like, so one rule. And E's focus shifted, and then he introduces his deception. Listen, he mixes the truth with the lie. That's what deception is. So he says, you won't die. That was a straight-out lie. That he says, no, God's playing you. You can't trust him. You know what? Because he is afraid of you. He's a, he knows that you'll become like him. You won't die. Well, that, the, the one part is you won't die is a lie. The part that's the truth is this, is that you will become like God, knowing both good and evil. Because at this point, all Adam and Eve knew was good. And God was the only one who knew evil. And that part was true. However, it wasn't going to be as joyous and as glorious as the serpent was making it out to look because God wasn't holding out to them. God was protecting them. You know, there was a school teacher who lost her entire savings in a, in a, in a Ponzi scheme or business scheme. And she went to the Better Business Bureau a, after the fact and she was talking to the, the guy and explaining the situation, and he was like, didn't you know about us? Why didn't you come to us first before you did this whole um, business interaction? And she said, well, yeah, I, I heard it, and I knew about you, but I was afraid if I came to you, you were going to tell me not to do it. <laughs> and how many times, it's like, yeah, we don't want to know the truth because we, we already do know the truth. Hey, trusting God's truth protects me from devil's deception. Look what happens next after he, he starts deceiving with mixing truth with lies in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. It says, The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and the fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. 
So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. See, when she got her eyes off of God's goodness, she began to believe the lie that God was holding out on her. And even though God warned her not to eat from the tree the knowledge of good and evil, all of a sudden it looked beautiful and delicious. She, listen to this, this is so important. She convinced herself that God's truth was no longer trustworthy, so she created her own truth. And her own truth looked desirable and it looked delicious. She was convinced. So the very thing that God told her was off limits. Now she felt a peace about it. And I'm telling you all the time, I'm hearing more and more of people telling me that they're, they're making decisions that are contrary to the scriptures, and they, and they say they feel a peace about it. And I'm telling you, if you are praying about something that the scriptures clearly say is, is wrong, then you're not hearing the voice of the Lord. You're hearing your own voice or the voice of the serpent who's trying to deceive you. Because listen, Eve was convinced that it was desirable and delicious and good. My translation, she had a piece about it. And all, she was going against the very words of God because she bit into the deception before she bit into the apple. Everyone say, trusting God's truth protects me from the devil's deception. Well, what ha- let's move on in the scriptures. Let's see what happens to Jesus. Now, Jesus had an interaction with the, with the devil as well. He was fasting food and water for 40 days. He was thirsty. He was hungry. He was tired. And how many of you know that's not a good combination? Uh, you know, we don't want to hang out with each other when we're thirsty, hungry, and tired. And Satan shows up in that moment of vulnerability and he begins to tempt Jesus three times. First, he, he tries to get Jesus to turn the stones into bread. And he says this, if you are the Son of God, see, the same thing from the garden. He's asking a question to try to plant doubt in Jesus' mind. Then he, then he tempts uh, Jesus to bow down before him and he would give him everything to, to create a shortcut from the cross. Then we, look at the, we pick up at the third temptation in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 9. It says, then the devil took him to Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple. And he says, if you are the son of God, which is the second time now that he says that to Jesus, keeps trying to plant that doubt, then jump off. For the scripture says, he will order his angels to protect and guard you, and they'll hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on the stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. And when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him for the next opportunity, until the next opportunity came. So we see here that, that the devil is trying to use deception. Listen, this is so important. By twisting the scriptures to say something that it's not really saying. He is going to Jesus, the living word, which I think is funny, right? Who has studied the scriptures his, his earthly life. And it's, it's embedded in his heart. And he, he's, he gets, tries to get him to jump off the temple because the angels of God will come and protect you. But Jesus responded to the devil's crafty and subtle, twisting the scriptures out of context with the accurate scripture, which he says, the scripture says, you must not test the Lord your God. See, the Satan will, will try to get scriptures twisted. And I'm telling you, we live in a generation where there's more twisting of Scripture that's happening than, than I've ever seen. It just continues to be distorted and twisted. So uh, as a church family, the people of Jesus, in the last days, if we're going to stand strong, we're going to have to stand strong with knowing God's Word. And not only knowing God's Word, but giving permission for the body of Christ, for each other, to, to help each other, hold each other accountable, because there's going to be people that are going to want to twist it to make it say what they want it to say, so they can justify their actions. Jessica Hahn, she was known because back in the 80s, there was a scandal with Jim Baker and Jessica Hahn, and um, the whole PTL thing came crashing down. And after that happened, she posed in Playboy magazine, and this is what she said, um, I hear others, um, well, this is what she said, I'm sorry, she said God gave her real peace about granting the interview and posing topless in Playboy. 
God gave her peace. And once again, we have to be careful that we do not create our own truth. See, we can pray all we want, but it's God's word that is truth, not mine and not yours. It's possible, listen, to doubt God's goodness to the point we convince ourselves that the opposite path is actually good. That's what Eve did. However, regardless of what we say, regardless of what we think, regardless of what we feel, if we disobey his word, the only person we're hurting is ourselves. The lies of the enemy, however, are exposed the more we know the truth. Knowing and obeying the scriptures isn't a religious thing. Knowing and following God's truth, it's a freedom thing. <laughs> Without knowing God's words true and his truth, um, it's hard to be faithful. We will be deceived. Trusting God's truth protects me from the devil's deceptions. And as we keep unpacking this, look, at, look with me in John chapter 8, because Jesus actually called the devil something in the scriptures. In John chapter 8, he says this to, to the religious leaders. He, he says, you are children of your father, the devil. You love to do evil, the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the what? The truth. The truth. He hated the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it's consistent with his character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. See, Jesus, on one hand, is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. Our spiritual enemy, Satan, he is the father of lies, and his character is deception. That is who he is, and that is his number one weapon against his people. And he, and so spiritual warfare, a huge part of spiritual warfare is to fight the devil by engaging in the truth. Because his number one weapon against us is, is, is deception. So we, have, we are called to meditate on the truth, to study the truth, to live the truth, to share the truth, and to daily saturate ourselves in the truth. That is engaging in spiritual warfare. So, so reading your Bible isn't just like this nice spiritual uh, discipline that's good to have if you can fit it in. It's a matter if we're going to be victorious in the end times or not. Because I'm telling you what, there are many people that I'm surprised at over the years that have fall prey to the deception of the enemy. You know, there's this story about this gentleman who desperately needed a job, and we know in the economy that there's jobs everywhere, but this guy thought it was a little strange, but he said, I'm going to apply for the zoo, see what jobs they have. And when he had an interview, they said, hey, this is a little bit... Um, you know, different for us, but we don't have the money to replace our, our gorilla. So if you're willing to put on a gorilla outfit and make gorilla noises, you're hired. And the guy thought for a moment, he said, you know what, that, that doesn't sound very authentic and integrous, but I need a job desperately, so we're going to do it. And, and at first it was very awkward and he was trying to get his bearings, but after a while he actually loved it. And he became one of the top attractions in the zoo. And so he was, was swinging from limb to limb one day and having fun doing what he does when he accidentally went over the fence and he landed in the, the exhibit next to him, which was the African lion exhibit. And he looked over there and there was a giant African lion. And instinctively, forgetting that he was portraying to be a gorilla, he started yelling, help, help, help. And all of a sudden he heard out of nowhere, shh. You better shut up or we're both going to lose our jobs. <laughs> oh. Deception. Deception. This is what 1 Peter 5 eight says. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He is prowling around. However, listen. He is a lion who's been declawed and defeated. You know, and since he's been declawed and defeated, he's prowling around, still trying to devour us. But how does he do that? By, by deception, by deceiving us little by little to get our eyes off of the truth. And so Peter says, pay attention. Church, pay attention. Keep your eyes on the truth. Study the truth. Know the truth. Saturate the truth. Pay attention because the enemy wants to destroy you. 
I love what Pastor John Mark Homer says. He highlights, he says, right after the Apostle Paul got done talking about marriage and sexuality in the church in Ephesians chapter 5, he goes into putting on the armor of God in chapter 6. And I want you to catch this. What is the, one of the first things in the list that Paul mentions in the armor of God? It says this in Ephesians 6, 10 through 11. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Verse 13, therefore put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. And guys, we are in that time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of what? The belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. So we're to be strong and stand upon God's truth. The first piece of armor is the belt of truth. And as believers, we have to put around our waist the belt of God's truth. When we lock that in, we're saying it doesn't matter what culture says, it doesn't matter what I feel, it doesn't matter what I think, because I am girded in God's truth. It's God's truth that exposes the lies. See, trusting God's truth protects me from the devil's, devil's deception. And then it says in verse, uh, at the very end, Revelation 20, verse 3 says, The angel threw him, the devil, the serpent, into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore. Until the thousand years were finished, afterwards he must be released for a little while. See, the devil was locked away for a thousand years so he could not, at the very end, so he could not deceive the nations. Once again, we see, see, we see this theme all throughout from beginning to the end. The devil's number one weapon is deception. Most, I want you to listen to this quote from John Mark Comer. He says, most sins are just symptoms of a deeper rooted sin. The sin of stopping up our ears to the truth of God and instead listening to a lie. Let that sink in for a minute, Jessica, as you come up as we uh, close. Let that sink in. That's what Eve did. She stopped up her ears to the truth of God's word and began to listen to a lie. And to the point it became delicious and delightful, and she reached out, and she felt a peace about it, even though she was walking in complete disobedience to the Lord. But I see a church in the last days who is hungry for God's word and God's truth. I see a church that's going to prioritize spending time in God's word, being saturated and girded in the belt of truth. I see a church following the word of God, exposing the lies of the enemy, walking in the power of God's spirit with the word of God, the sword of the spirit in his hand. See, trusting God's truth protects me from the devil's deception. Carl Armanding was sharing a story, another zoo story, ironically, how he was watching this exhibit where the zookeeper walked in to the, it was the, uh, I believe it was the wildcat exhibit, and he didn't walk in with a weapon or anything, and so the guy is sweeping out the exhibit, and he noticed that he poked the, wild, the wildcat and the wildcat hissed at him, but then moved to the opposite side of the exhibit so he could keep swimming, sw swimming, sweeping. And he, he asked the, the zookeeper, he says, he says, man, you're certainly a brave man. And the zookeeper says, I ain't no brave man. He says, well, yes, you are. He says, I see you don't have any weapon. And he says, oh, okay, well, it must be a tame wildcat. He says, no, it's not a tame wildcat. He says, well, if it's not a tame wildcat, and you're not brave, then, then tell me, what, what is it? He's, he's, and he he kind of chuckled and he said, well, you see, he's an old, lion, an old wildcat and he doesn't have any teeth. See, the devil has been defeated through death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We just did a, we ended the Luke series on, on the death and resurrection of Jesus. The, the Lord is one, we are victorious, we are in Christ. And so he has to resort to hissing with dece deception. He will lie, he will twist to get you to doubt God's word and promises. And he'll try to get you to carve your own truth. You say, well, how do you know if you're carving your own truth? 
if you have to put a but after, the, after God's promise or God's word, then you're starting to create your own truth. Yeah, I know that was, that was then, but own truth. You know, but it was a different time, but own truth. God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains. Everything is going to melt away, but God's word is going to stand strong, and it will last for eternity. And so that is what, if we are Christ followers, if, then that becomes our, our, our path, our guide, a lamp unto our feet and a light into our path. And so let's become more and more familiar with God's word. Let's make it a priority like eating physical food. I know some of you guys are like, well, I don't eat breakfast. Yeah, you may not eat breakfast, but I bet you you eat lunch or dinner. But how, how easy is it for us to go a whole day without cracking open God's, God's truth? And, and I'm just telling you, if we're going to stand strong, we have to be girded with truth. So trusting God's truth protects me from the devil's deceptions. And so what we're going to do is this, is this week we're going to do, you know how we've been talking a lot about the SOAP method? Uh, the so Bible reading plan, it stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. And it's just, uh, there's, there's a lot of different methods to read the Bible, but this is just one of them that you read the, you read the passage of Scripture, then you, you, you take a moment to write down what you observe is taking place, and then you take a moment to prayerfully talk through how to apply that to your life, and then you take a moment to pray that very Scripture for, over yourself in that day. Well, we're going to kind of, we want to help model that and help lead you through that. So this week on, on our um, Facebook page, our public page, Wyandotte Family Church, um, our staff at every day at 8 a.m. is going to do a SOAP um, method for you to tune in live and join us. But here's the cool thing is if you can't make it because you're already working at 8, then um, you, we're going to save the video on that page so you can go back and watch it and kind of just practice it with us. And, uh, and we're going we're gonna to do something a little fun, is there's five books of the Bible that only have one chapter in it. And so we're going to do um, all, Monday through Friday, we're going to do um, one of those chapters a day. And, and Pastor James has the hardest one. He has Obadiah. I mean, how many of you have ever read Obadiah before? Yeah, it's like, like I probably never, you know, like, yeah. It's a, it's a tougher one, but Pastor James has that. We love you, Pastor James. And then... Uh, uh, I, I'll get the little easier ones on, uh, later on in the week. But uh, um, so tune in um, every day this week because we want to be a church that is girded with the truth of God's word because we are only going to be bombarded in the, in the coming days with more deception and more lies. And if people bite into the deception bef before they bite into the fruit, then because it's going to look desirable and delicious, those who are over here girded in God's truth are going to stand out like a sore, stick out like a sore thumb, and we might even be hated for it. But you know what? We're going to continue to do what we're called to do, which is love, which is to serve, and which is to give, which is to bless, regardless of what people view us or what they say to us or how they treat us. We, 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 you know, we're, we're following a different leader in the family of Jesus, and that's, that's him. Amen? And if you've never crossed the line into a relationship with Jesus, one of the greatest deceptions the enemy gives us is this, is you could, you could make it to heaven by just being good enough. You know, and, you know, if you just try, you'll, you'll be fine, and you'll, you know, and I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people that said, you know, I hope when I, I stand before God, my good outweighs my bad, and I, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm like, bro, <laughs> uh, your bad is way down here, right? And you're good. It's like, dee, 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 okay? Um, that's me too. So like, that's why Jesus died on the cross. And he gave his life because when you become a Christ father, when you cross the line to relationship with Christ, when you say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior, um, what happens, the Bible says, his righteousness covers you in that moment. It's like you put on a spiritual robe and no longer does God look at you full of your sin. He looks at you full of the righteousness of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. And so I want to just pray, because if you've never prayed that prayer, 
I, I, um, and you've never done that, will you pray with me? And, uh, and then we'll go ahead and dismiss. So God, I thank you that you love me, and I thank you that you died in the cross. Lord, we're talking about deception. God, the people that were killing you, were mocking you, and making fun of you, thinking that they were doing good, all the while they were destroying the, uh, the, 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 the creator of the universe in the flesh. But Jesus, you didn't just die, you rose again, victorious, and you are alive, and you reign, and I want to know you, I want to follow you, I want to be a part of the family of Jesus. So will you, God, forgive me of my sins and take ownership of my life. I give it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And those of you who prayed that prayer online, please click the button, raise hand. Our prayer, our, our online host would love to pray with you. And if you prayed that prayer in the gathering, please mark that down on a communication card. Take it to the Connection Center. We would love to, to follow up with you. We love you. We believe in you. We're praying for you. Let, let's have fun on Facebook this week, 8 o'clock every day. Tonight is our prayer meeting, 6 o'clock, and Roots is at 5.30. God bless you. Have a great day.